Well, we're going to continue our focus on transformation. Uh, last week we talked about the uh, spiritual transformation that God has uh, called us to. And transformation is just, uh, as we talked about last week, it's going from the old self to something new that God has designated for us. He's designed for us. Um, because we are lost in our sin and we are in that kind of old rut, that old way of thinking, that old way of feeling, the old way of behaving, it's hard for us to transition to something that's new. And so we're focusing on how we do that as uh, in a realistic Christian experience, how we, how, how we transition from the old to the new. And today we're going to talk about the mental or intellectual transformation of ourselves. And I think this is an important message, especially uh, nowadays, because we uh, it's this time of year where you see all the kids that are going to the homecoming dances. And I've seen pictures of Lydia and Zoe and, and, and Aubrey and some of the others. They're going to these dances and, and it makes you, you just think about what a great community activity for young people to be able to go to these, uh, these uh, wonderful things that are done. I did, did check with uh, Zoe to make sure that grinding is still outlaw outlawed at Tri-Village. Uh, th that's a dance for you old. Some of you know what it, that dance is? We had to outlaw it a few years ago at Tri-Village. So they still don't allow that, I guess. Uh, but uh, when you see that, you think about what a wonderful thing that school systems are. And today when I talk about these things that I'm going to talk about. I don't want you to, to think in any way, shape, or form that I'm anti-public education or anti-anything that has to do with school. It's a marvel how we have both facilitated and funded uh, the secondary education, elementary education, uh, universities, and beyond to teach our children things. The problem is not that we have the system that's in place. It's what has taken over that system in the last few years, last uh, dec a couple of decades, that concerns that should concern us as parents when we think about our kids. And this is just an illustration for this idea about intellectual transformation. For children who attend public school, just for instance, from kindergarten to 12th grade, parents can expect to spend a total of roughly $162,899.86. Now, if you want to write that number down, you don't have to. Why? It's on your listening sheet today. And that's why I wrote it there. And I have all the verses there as well. So that if you miss a verse or you miss, I go too quick uh, through the verse, or you want to go back and, and, and revisit something that we talked about, you can look at the listening sheet. $162,899.86. Now, this is on average, of course. You may not spend this. This also includes uh, extracurricular activities, including the sports that you have to sign them up for. You know, you got to pay to play these days with kids. So you can experience, you can expect to invest a big chunk of change in your kids in their education, right? We all agree on that. We can accept that fact. And then if they come to you someday and they want to tell you that they'd like to attend the University of Harvard uh, and you go, oh, 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 you can expect to spend for four years of university, not necessarily at Harvard, be much more there, from 100000 to 250000 but probably more if you go to an Ivy League school. But if you go to an in-state school, between 100000 and 250000 that's on top of the 162000 that you're already investing in your kids. So all told, by the time you get them through university, maybe three, four hundred thousand dollars you've invested in them, and you might think, well, I've never made that much money. That's right, because you're going to be paying for it in loans until after you die, you know, somehow. Now, this is, this is uh, just the system that has developed here in the United States of America. And as, as I said, I'm not anti-education. But the current secularized and scientized education system has transformed into not an educational system, but an indoctrination system. You're funding the mental deformation of your child to the tune of at least a quarter of a million dollars in the indoctrination of secularism and scientism. And I'm going to explain all this, so I hope I don't lose you here at the beginning of the message. 
All of this is designed, secularism and scientism is designed so that your children will grow up and reject the factors that follow, that God is the creator of the universe. He's the curator of this world. And curator just means he cares for it. He provides for it. He does everything to make sure that we have everything that we need in it. He's the curator. And that he has provided for us the necessary wisdom that we need and the wealth. And I'll use the word wealth because he has been good to us. We breathe. We have everything available to us that we need. He has blessed us with great wealth. They would like for you or your children to not even think about God in those contexts. He is not our creator. He's not our curator. He is not wise. And he does not provide anything for me. When that's the case, we might describe that as a demonic, dark world conspiracy that's been in the making for at least 100 years. And if you really want to get into the research of this, I'll make reference to a book you could look at later on. But you can, you can do your own research on these things and ask the, the same kind of questions. Are they really trying to educate our children in reading, writing, and arithmetic? You grew up saying the three R's, right? And I always said, well, arithmetic, arithmetic starts with what? Letter A. Never got it. But they're coming home and they're being indoctrinated with political ideas of socialism and scientism and secularism. And the result is that young people are getting stuck mentally in an old, failed, principled way of thinking that has been deforming mankind since the very beginning. It deforms them from the inside out, and it leaves them severely, discour severely discouraged in life because nothing is working out for them. How do we know this? Well, God says, you reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap fleshly things, which are frustrating. If you, slow, uh, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap the spiritual blessings of God in life. No one gets away with it. People may fool themselves into thinking that they're great and they're grand and they're wonderful, but their um, prescriptions that they have to get just through the cope through the cope with the day, the the kind of things that they have to do just to feel better about themselves. And on top of that, you know, with your kids, when you're raising them, what's their default mode? Is that they're smarter than you anyway. And so if you have someone that's teaching them that your parents, if they're talking about God or creation or those kinds of things, you're smarter than your mom and dad. And they'll just, they'll just buy into that hook, line, and sinker because mom and dad are the fool until they reach about 30 years old. And then they go, well, mom and dad are a little smarter than I thought. Now, Jesus has made it possible for you and your children and grandchildren to be mentally transformed as you're renewed in your mind by the Spirit to absorb the educational principles that we should. And again, when we're talking about math and, and, and the true sciences and uh, the reading and English and the different languages that we might learn, I have no problem with learning about those different kinds of things. But when they're framed absent, the idea of the existence of God or His involvement, the fact that He wants to exercise in our life, that's when it transforms into something different. It deforms their minds. Because they're looking at life from a perspective of a lie. That if God doesn't exist, that we just evolved and we're here by chance, that God's not involved in my life at all, I'm the master of my own domain... If that's the way they look at life and live life, they're going to be discouraged and they're going to get frustrated and it's some, some will give up. And some will turn to self-medication self and some will turn to violence and other kinds of things. That's why this verse from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 is so important because it is imperative that we understand that life is about God and we are His creation. And it says, therefore, in 12, Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, on your listening sheet, you'll see that I have some words in parentheses that might help us better grasp what this verse means. We can be transformed as we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. This is a proper way to live our lives. The word holy and pleasing can also be translated as proper. This is your true and proper worship. Rational and reasonable is the Greek word that's used there. This is not some fly-by-night, just kind of crazy, you know, spiritual thing. It's got teeth in terms of the rational and reasonable aspect of our lives. When we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Creator God, this is the most rational and reasonable act that any person can do. It's true and proper worship or service, or worship can also mean service to God. Then it warns us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing. That word renewing means renovation. Some of you might be familiar with the remodeling and renovation of our homes. We're trying to fix what has been broken or what has been put into disrepair because, by uh, things, uh, factors that are outside our control. Sometimes they're within our control. Because this is our pleasing and perfect. That word is complete. God wants to complete us according to His will. And this is God's will. It is His determination. Now, the word God's will just means this is what He's determined for you to get to. That's why sin is falling short of His glory. His determination is for you to get to the point where you're living His glorious life through Christ. And when we sin, it's just us, it's just us failing to get there because we're getting in our own way by making bad decisions. God's will for us, His determination for us is good. It's beneficial. It's wealthy. And it's what completes us. So the second step in the transformation process, we talked about spiritual transformation last week, but the second step is to, uh, is to allow the principles which God are thinking to always include the existence of God and the understanding that He is exercising His will through our lives. A simple little concept. The principle of life is that God is, He exists, and He's working in us every day. And can He do that through math and science and English and uh, reading and the other things that we learn in public education? Absolutely. But we put our children at a disadvantage and our grandchildren at a disadvantage when we sit back and we allow those who have determined that they're going to indoctrinate our kids with things beyond that. That say or suggest to our children, God does not exist. Can anybody think of a theory that might suggest that? Or that God does not exercise in our lives. He is absent from our lives. He does not care about us. That's why mental transformation is so very important. Because the first half of this is that mental transformation is the renovation of our intellect through our reasonable presentation of our existence to God. It's on your listening sheet in case you missed that. It is our reasonable presentation of our existence to God. Say, so here I am, I'm, I want to learn all the things I can. So it'd be the same if you're going to go to work. You know, you want to learn how to go to tech school or you want to go to work and be trained in some kind of job. You want to do all those things. But when you go to, say, a tech school or you go to another different job, I'm sure that the teacher doesn't stand up and say, first of all, before I teach you how to turn this wrench, you need to understand that God, God does not exist. Would that make any sense to you if you were in a class like that? Now, you might argue with them, but the fact of the matter is it has nothing to do with it other than you trying to create an indoctrination in my mind that God does not exist here. So mental transformation, what Romans 12, 1 through 2 tries to encourage us to do is to reasonably present our existence to God. 
I am here, Lord, and you are here with me. We are transformed intellectually when we worship God as our creator and our curator. God is our creator. He loves us. And he is our curator. He takes care of us. And it's more than just say, well, you know, God exists, so uh, thanks, God. And then you go all along and just do whatever you want. He also is our curator. He puts us places where we can be a masterpiece for him, if you want to use that terminology. He protects us so that we um, can uh, shine for him in this world. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, even claims that without faith it is impossible to please God because everyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Believe in that He exists, rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Colossians goes on to say, verse, chapter 1, verse 16 through 17, For in Him all things were created, Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and what? For Him. So what happens to, I don't know, life if you just take the God thing right out, that Jesus doesn't exist, He doesn't matter? It'd be kind of like me saying to you, I want you to go drive home today, but you can't use your car. How does that handicap you when you can't use the very vehicle that gets you where you need to go? It disables us and it can be very frustrating for us because then we start walking towards home wondering, well, why is it taking me so long to get there? And why is it so painful? And this is just, people are whizzing by throwing their trash at me. Mental transformation is when we present our existence to God because we know He's our Creator, and everything was created through Him and for Him. So why would I set that aside in life and then expect my life to be good? The problem is that we've had so many years of indoctrination that we've been caught up in the whole idea of destroying the masterpiece. Y'all are familiar with the Mona Lisa? She lives over here on Second Cross Street. No, it's, just, it's, a, it's a painting. Who, who painted it? Da Vinci, was it? Okay, so they have the Mona Lisa up in this real nice uh, uh, museum, art museum. And they've had a problem six times over the last few years. There have been activists who've gone in and thrown soup on the Mona Lisa. And I think the last time was just here recently. They went and they threw tomato soup on the Mona Lisa. Now, when's the last time Mona did anything to anybody? Does he hurt anybody? Is the, I mean, is the fact that she's just hanging there on a wall, is that bothering someone? Yet, indoctrinated young people, these are all young people, by the way, they're upset about something, whether it's oil or the earth or the climate, they want to draw attention, so they've been indoctrinated with the idea, since there's no God, and there's no sense to have respect, and there's no exercise of God in our life, you just go get whatever attention you need, and you can destroy anything along the way. And you know where they get that idea? They get it from their own lives, because they will do anything to themselves to destroy themselves along the way to get the attention that they need. That happens when we are deformed in the way that we think. I am a creation of God, and He's taking care of me. So why would I do anything to destroy myself or destroy anything that He has created or cares for? The current trend is to secularize intellect to, include, to exclude the creation and curation of God. So that's what, if you ever heard the word secularism, they're going to secularize it. That means to de-God it. You know, you're going to take God, any reference of God, any perspective of God, you take that out. And so we have been convinced, uh, especially in the last 40 or 50 years, that God is not welcome in the public schools or in the public realm. 
You can't talk about him in politics. You can't talk him down at the high school or the grade school or whatever. You can't bring God because that's religious hate. Okay? That's all part of a product of the secularized intellect to exclude the creation, curation of God. It just says, we can't afford to have God mentioned in any context around here. Yet again, we are cutting out one of the most important things that we need to understand about life, and that is that God exists and He cares for us. Satan doesn't care if your children don't learn about reading, writing, and arithmetic through these whole things. He's just using the process to indoctrinate your kids in socialism and Marxism. Those are examples of how we de-God. And, and, and again, these things exist. I'm not saying that they don't. And I'm not making judgment on them. God makes judgment on them. They judge themselves because they are trying to exclude God from their process of thinking. That's why anyone who claims to be a socialist or Marxist is dangerous. Because their end goal will be to exclude as much of God from the public square as they possibly can, which debilitates all of us as it deforms our minds. That's why elections matter. You know, well, it doesn't matter if we, if we elect someone who's a socialist or who, someone, who, who sounds like they're a Marcus, Marxist. Eh, that doesn't really matter. I mean, you can govern without actually believing in God. At one time, we believed we were a nation under God and that we could not operate apart from God. That's why these things matter in our lives. They matter when it comes to how we deal with our kids. Our intelligence can be renewed by the Spirit day by day as long as we focus on the bigger picture of God's existence and His care for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, listen to this, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We need to focus day by day on the bigger picture of God's existence, His creation and curation of our lives. That's what gets us through the temporary frustrations that we might feel, the troubles that we have to go through. And again, when Paul writes this to the Corinthians, he doesn't say their life is so super horrible. He's just saying that we all, when you're living in a world trying to live for Jesus, you're going to have those things that are trying to waste you away outwardly. We get tired and we get fatigued and those things happen. But the cure for us is to be renewed day by day. Because we realize whatever we're going through in this life cannot compare to the eternal glory that God has in store for us. That's why we fix our eyes on Jesus. Not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because we know what is unseen, God's creation, His curation is eternal. Now, someone asks, I've been here in Palestine for 33 years. And the church has changed a lot. And... Some of the people have changed, and some of you have been here, around here since the, the very beginning, like Jack and Joyce and some of the others, Virginia. We've been here, and we've served the Lord. The church has changed. Worship's changed. The screen, we've had it for a while, though, haven't we? But there were times when everything was just a little bit different. And the one question that I have to deal with every once in a while when, you know, I'm not celebrated as one of the great pastors of the United States of America, and we don't have people overflowing into the outside room to just come here. Pastor Michael speak, of the, you know, the wisdom. Of course, if that happens, just go ahead and kick me out because that's, that'd be about my ego anyway, right? The thing that gets me through is the small picture of Palestine has never been small to me. I've always looked at, at the bigger picture of what God is trying to do through me in this place. And God is blessed my family, He's blessed me, and I want to bless others with this truth. Second thing about mental transformation is the renovation 
of our intellect takes place through our rigorous exercise of God's will in our lives. Renovation of our intellect comes through rigorous exercise of God's will in our lives. God is ready to blow you up, brother and sister. When we allow God's will to be active in our hearts and our minds and we renew our mind day by day and we are transformed by the renewing of our mind and we present ourselves to God, watch out because there's some incredible things that He's going to do. But not just out there. He's going to do it in here and right here with your kids and your grandkids and in your family and in your neighborhood and with the people that you know. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 9 reminds us, We do not have or speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of the age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom. A mystery that has been hidden and that God has destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord, uh, the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear, no, what no ear has heard, heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. Did you hear that? What God has prepared for those who love Him? Now, how can you live your life without thinking about God being a part of it, if that's the case? We've fallen into a, a problem here with... I was listening to a, a guy by the name of Charles Comacy the other day. He's an um, ethicist of some court, a med medical ethicist. And he was describing how the world, as it has been secularized through scientism, how doctors that we used to be able to count on to protect life now, law, now see life as a negotiation. That, whether it's for unborn babies or it's for people at the end of their lives, uh, vegetative state or whatever they might call it, he said that life has become a negotiation. Is it worth, say for instance, keeping a person alive? This is one of the things that he brings up. Is it worth keeping a person alive if their organs can help others stay alive? One of his conclusions is that young people, especially those who are coming up in the medical professional, they have been indoctrinated on a very basic sense to defend the taking of life when their oath is always to protect life. Now, you can fill in the blank. When is it okay to take the life of another life? I'm talking about human life. Justifiable murder has been thrown out there for those who are unworthy of being considered as good as you or who you deem to be worthy of their life or the things they have. Now, the problem he has with that is that that's kind of a pagan idea, and he kept talking about this repaganization of our society in which during the, the uh, Greek reign and during the Roman reign, they used to just have a cavalier attitude about life. And, life. and he talked about how they would uh, take little girls that were born and because they couldn't make as much money off of them unless they put them into slave trade, they would take little baby girls and they would go throw them out on the dump heap outside of town because they just didn't care about that value of that life. And what Christians used to do is they used to go find these babies and they started taking care of them. And the dynamic of the value of life changed Within a couple, hundred of ye a couple of hundreds of years then, when the church became more prominent in society and then it was made the, the national religion of Rome. But he said we are dangerously skirting back to that justifiable murder of the unworthy because people have been indoctrinated with that idea that life is negotiable. Now, why is that? It's because we believe life is our 
it's ours. And in a sense it is, but God has given this, us this life. It is sacred. It is something that God has blessed us with and something that God says in due time or in your time, I will take it away from you. That's why all the arguments that we hear today about people who want to protect life, we just have to understand these folks really believe that they're making sense and that they have a value that's important. And don't attack the person, but you need to challenge them on that idea of how some people, some beings, some living beings are unworthy enough to just take their lives because they're inconvenient. The current trend right now is called scientism, where we scientize intellect to eliminate the wisdom and wealth of God. So if we eliminate God's wisdom and what He says about life, and that is that we're sacred, and that He will provide for us whatever we need when we honor Him and do what He's called us to do, He will always provide everything that we need. When we remove that from the context of our conversation, then what develops is atheism or scientism, which is deadly. And that's why when your kids come home and they've learned about evolution, it matters. It's not just some banal theory that, that, that the science teacher who learned when they were in university is teaching your kids. It is an effort, not by the, the, uh, not by the science teacher, he's just doing or she's just doing what she's learned, but it's an effort, it's a concerted effort, contrived effort, a behind-the-scenes effort that's demonic in nature, which tries to tell your children that God does not care about them, that His wisdom is moot. There's nothing that God can bring to their lives. And He is not going to bless them when they're obedient to that wisdom. That's why these things matter when we're talking with our kids. Our intelligence is renewed by the Spirit, thought by thought, as long as we focus not just on the bigger picture, but on the bigger progress that God can do. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We put off the old self and we put on the new self that's created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And we can't do that when we say God's wisdom doesn't matter. It's not welcome here. And I don't care what God has promised that He's going to do for me. I want to do my own thing. Now I mentioned Harvard and that's kind of the Harvard and Yale, those are the those are the uh, things that everybody looks to say, these are great universities. And, and used to, Yale and Harvard were actually started as religious universities, Christian universities, to train men for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then it kind of grew into a, a, a more uh, a liberal kind of thing in terms of uh, personal develop, de development in different ways. Now we have what we have with them. And I'm, I'm sure that they're great schools uh, on some level. Again, I'm fascinated by their facilitation and how they fund themselves more than what it is that uh, they teach because what they teach is not something that welcomes God anymore. But let me offer this to you. Your child probably will never go to Harvard, and if they do, look me up when they graduate and tell me. But let me suggest this. One child who graduates from Travel Edge or Arcanum or Ansonia or Greenville, one child who graduates from Wright State University or Ohio State University with Christ still in their hearts, they're smarter and more intelligent and more prepared for life than anyone who graduates from Harvard without Christ in their life. Now, those things might give them privilege and it might give them some things that other children may not have, but it's not preparing them to experience the true and righteous holiness of God in which God is creating a new self in them day by day, thought by thought. God has a bigger plan for us in His wisdom and His wealth. Now, I have to admit, and I don't want to, but we've lost the battle of indoctrination 
uh, for back in the 50s, 60s, there was a great battle. There was a great fight that took place. And the Supreme Court stepped in and said, we can't have God in schools. It's just not right. So indoctrination has continued to become a part of our public school system. And if you or your kids attended public school or university, you just need to accept the fact that some form of indoctrination has taken place. But we can still win the war because intellectual transformation is available to us all, all the time through Christ. God is good all the time. He is greater than all things. And as long as we bring our lives and all the things that we've learned, He can kind of amalgamize those things, synthesize those things so that what we did learn, the good things can help us in life. But then we can increase our, our understanding of this world because of His wisdom in us. We are mentally, intellectually transformed when we see our life and living through the spectrum of God. And as long as we're looking for, through His spectrum of life and living for Him and through Him, He will always take care of us and will always be able to reach for His glory. And if the principles that guide us are based in the existence of God, being our creator and curator, experienced through His wisdom and wealth, then our minds are being renewed by the Spirit day by day, thought by thought. So how can you tell if you've been indoctrinated? Well, if you're confused about this election, confused about the idea of evolution, that might be a sign. Now, I'm not political here, and I'm never going to tell you who you should vote for or how you should vote. You'll never get that out of me from the pulpit. And I probably wouldn't even tell you if you ask me personally. But these things matter to your children and your grandchildren. But if we feel justified in destroying God's masterpiece on any level, which is what God created us to be, or if we feel justified in deeming others as unworthy of God's life in them, then we need to confess that indoctrination in our lives at this moment and repent of that stronghold. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 6 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Take every stronghold of indoctrination that has been thrown into your mind, into your heart, and into the life of your kids and your grandkids that says God does not exist, that He is not our creator, He's not our curator, that His wisdom doesn't matter, that He does not provide for us in an incredible way. You just got to gotta work on that with them in your own mind. Now, this is a message just using as an illustration. It's a pinhole peak in a battle far beyond our ability to address today. It is a battle, though, a war, a war over correct ideas. The classroom is our battlefield, the hearts and minds of our kids, the prize, the survival of the American Republic and the greatness of Western civilization are at stake. And that's a quote from a book called Battle for the American Mind by Pete Hegseth and David Godwin. Goodwin. So if you want to look into a little deeper in that, just look that up. Battle for the American Mind and see what they have to say about what's going on from a specific standpoint and what might be done about that. But how are we to see this war? How we see this war will determine our response to it. There are those, like the authors mentioned above, who have laid out a comprehensive plan to address this matter. So investigate it if you must. But we cannot forsake the very heart of the matter we're talking about today. And John Dewey and others like him, who formulated and facilitated the demonic plan which confounds the best of our educators today, we must stand up against that. And we do that when we talk to our children day by day, thought by thought. We don't have to go invade their classroom. If you want a conversation with their teachers or the school board, mm, more power to you. I'd love for you to do that. 
But our battle is with them day by day, thought by thought, when we encourage them to understand that God is the creator and care of their lives. And he has wisdom for us that brings wealth into our lives. Even the well-intentioned are being bullied into compliance in the classroom. Teachers who are God, good Christian, godly people, they're being forced to be quiet and set in their corner. So we must, at the very minimum, debrief our kids daily as we infuse them with the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And we must daily remind them and demonstrate to them that God is our creator and our curator, a creator and curator. He has our back. He's watching over us and we must exercise our thoughts to experience God's wisdom and wealth in our lives. Day by day, thought by thought. This is the war we must fight. It is the war we will win because God says He will win. And if we are on His side, we will win. We'll be more than conquerors. The only uncertain matter is whether your children will win with you or be lost in the dark indoctrination of this world in spite of what you try to do for them. Day by day, thought by thought, thought. He's our creator, our curator. He has wisdom for us and he will bless us with his great wealth. Teach your children. Renew their thinking through those principles and God will see them through.